Yeah. Thank you for being here to participate in WAP and Aga Khan Health Board's collaborative launch and introductory hormonal health awareness webinar. Many of us don't fully understand the importance of our hormones and how we can, through awareness of our bodies, begin to support our endocrine system and therefore begin to manage better associated health issues and gain holistic approaches to our overall well-being. On screen, you will see today's agenda. Today, we have two experts in their fields who will discuss why our hormonal health should be part of our daily awareness. For those that can stay online with us a few minutes longer today, Dr. Ravia Lalani, gastroenterologist and yogi, will guide us through some supportive, healthy breathing to conclude our session. So without further delay, this moves me swiftly on to present WAP's National Council member, Shalina Huda, to say a few words. Thank you, Iman, and Yalim and everyone. Um, it's a pleasure, as we've already said, to be presenting this topic to you. Um, and I know that we are presenting today uh, for, to multiple locations. So I know that we've got people from the UK as well as outside the UK. So it's, um, it's lovely to have you all um, and to be having a global reach uh, with all of our sisters, maybe some brothers who might be on the, on the line as well today. WAP is all about supporting women throughout their lives. Um, and one of our key targets is to empower women to make better choices about their well-being from a physical and emotional perspective. And we believe this topic today is very key to achieving that. We want to welcome you all, as I said. Um, we also welcome any feedback that you have, any suggestions that you have for future topics. So please engage as much as possible. Um, as Iman said, you can use the chat function for posting questions um, and the mentee section for posting questions as well later on to our guest speakers. And we hope you find today very informative. I'll now hand back to Iman. Thank you, Lena. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Farah Gina Condor who will look at the physiological makeup of our system and associated hormones. Yalima there everybody and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very honoured to be here to share my knowledge with you, which I think is knowledge that's going to help you to better understand what it is that... Causes. I wanted to start the presentation with just going through your body systems and obviously it's crucial uh, that we all know what our body systems are. Um, initially just looking at that slide is just about looking at the fact that you've got a skeletal system, that you've got a digestive system, respiratory system, um, all of those systems have uh, an impact. Uh, the endocrine health has an impact on all of those systems. Next slide, please. The endocrine system is very simple and also very complex. Uh, they have glands. So you have an endocrine system that has glands that releases a chemical messenger and that chemical messenger is called a hormone. It then travels through your bloodstream to your tissues and organs and gives a specific message to your organs and your tissues to do a certain job. There, where they go, they meet a receptor and the receptor accepts the signal and the cells then take action. So if, for example, it's to release a hormone, that's the process within which a um, uh, endocrine system would work. Next slide, please. The endocrine system works with the whole body um, without going through individually each of the um, body systems. And, oh, is there somebody? Hello? Okay, without going through uh, each of the body systems that, that it works with, just know that it works for the whole body and it basically controls lots of things, responses to stress, maintaining your salt, water and nutrient balances, regulating metabolism. That means regulating how efficiently your body works. It's like your engine system, regulating growth and development, sexual functions, helping stabilize moods, helping assist movement. Um, so you can, you can see how it impacts right across the body in terms of how it actually affects the whole body system. Next slide, please. The glands of the endocrine system, there's a, a, a picture of all the glands that exist in the endocrine system. The ones that are generally more referred to uh, commonly are the um, thyroid gland. Lots of people suffer from thyroid issues, whether that's uh, hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, and therefore they'll know that very well. Obviously, most people know the M 
ovary and the testes, which are the sexual organs. And some people also know a little bit about the adrenal glands and might have heard that there's adrenal stress. That means they are the glands that when you are in stress are activated to respond by releasing a hormone in order to manage that stress. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit about uh, the endocrine gland, the hormone and its functions. So if you look at the particular gland, there's a list of hormones that are actually associated with that gland that are released by that gland. So if I just talk about, whilst you look at the screen, the ovaries, for example, as we will be talking about um, issues involving the uh, sexual hormones, estrogen stimulates the development of the female reproductive system and progesterone stimulates the development of the female reproductive system. And progesterone, for example, is really crucial in... Um, in pregnancy where increased progesterone and consistent levels of progesterone will help the pregnancy to develop um, properly. And if there isn't that consistent level of progesterone, then that can affect the way that the, the pregnancy um, develops. The other is obviously you can just have a quick read of, there's uh, uh, all of the systems that I've talked about in the previous slide, which is about water reabsorption, the kidneys, sleep and wake cycles, etc. Next slide, please. Okay, what are hormones and how do they work? So we talked about the endocrine system. We've talked about the fact the endocrine system releases hormones, which are chemical messengers that are created. They're coded, they're sent around the body, they're met by a receptor where the action is then um, starts. So when the hormones are released, they're released by the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. And um, the, the pituitary gland is what actually releases the required hormones to circulate into the body. Normally, unless you've got a feedback loop that's stuck, which is when there are issues holistically, the way we look at it and functionally, your then hypothalamus would tell your pituitary gland to slow down the, promote, the, 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 the production of the particular hormone. If there are issues um, in, in your body functionally and holistically, then what would happen is that that loop would be stuck going round and round. So you would continue to either produce the hormone or not produce enough of the hormone. So that's one of the, one of the things that we look at functionally is what's happening with that system and how is it working? Is it working effectively? Again, just looking at some of the types and activities of hormones, we've talked about progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, which is obviously the male hormone. Um, then we've got folli follicle stimulating hormone, which helps women maintain healthy eggs and men healthy sperm. We've got prolactin, which is milk production hormone for women who, after they give birth, if they don't release prolactin, then they may have issues actually breastfeeding. And some of the others, which are thyroid and oxytocin, which is the um, social sexual reproduction hormone. Next slide, please. The basic hormone type. So this is a little bit of a complex slide, but in its simplicity, basically your hormones can be made up of amino acids or steroid based. Amino acids are made up um, uh, from protein. So protein is, protein is what you would eat in terms of say a steak or cheese, there would be protein in there. And then that protein breaks down into something called amino acids. These amino acids help to make up some of the hormones that your body has to produce. There are two types. One is essential, therefore they cannot be made by the body. And then there is non-essential, which means that the body makes them naturally. The essential hormones in general need some little help. And that little help is in the form of what you eat and what you put into your body. Steroid-based hormones are um, made up of lipids, which is a fat-based substance. And most people would question this, but basically these types of steroid-based hormones are made from cholesterol. So there is an issue of, obviously we know that a lot of people take statins and there are two different cholesterols, your LDL and your HDL, but it essentially hormones require, some of the hormones require cholesterol to be made up. Next slide, please. Um, there are some reasons why you might suffer from an endocrine disorder. And that's if your gland is compromised, not working effectively to support your whole system. Um, this would normally need a diagnosis from a medical practitioner. So therefore, holistically, functionally, I wouldn't diagnose such a thing. It would have to be a medical professional. However, once diagnosed, then holistically, 
it, there, there's an ability for professional who works functionally in nutrition to actually be able to help with the right types of nutrition and supplements to be able to uh, help you get to the place you need to get to in terms of rebalance. You can't catch an endocrine disorder, so it is non-communicable. And common health issues associated with endocrine disorders include topics like infertility, um, polycystic ovary syndrome, prostate issues, and severe menopausal issues, as well as diabetes, heart disease, as I've mentioned already, hypo and hyperthyroidism, adrenal disorders, and blood sugar regulation. Balance is the key. So the food you eat and the lifestyle that you have is crucial. The hormonal balance itself is a delicate state of being and understanding uh, how it works and some of the basics of the fact that they're so important uh, is, is crucial to, to a balanced uh, way of being. Next slide, please. What can impact on your endocrine system? Well, there's your endocrine system in the middle. You've got the environment, you've got what you eat, and you've got genetics. Next slide, please. So we've got chemicals everywhere that um, we are, we go in the air, in, in uh, our, our body products. We've got chemicals in food, the way it's manufactured, grown, and things that are sprayed on it. EDC is particularly a mixture of chemicals that interfere with the body's hormone uh, and how it works. And our bodies become sensitive to those hormones and our own hormones because these EDCs are mimicking our hormones can become imbalanced. Um, some of those are PCBs and BPA. You'll have heard a lot about plastics, which is the BPA. So don't drink from plastic bottles if they've been in the car and warmed because the BPA actually seeps into the water. This can affect reproductive health and it does so by mimicking or blocking the effects of the female hormones. Some of the effects are decreased level of hormones in our blood and how they're made and broken down and stored. Um, obviously it's complex, but that's in its simplicity. The next slide, please. The facts about um, EDCs, global productions of plastics grew from 50 million tons in the 70s to nearly 300 million tons today. So we can see that there's been a massive impact on the way that uh, those EDCs are affecting our food chain, etc. Of the hundreds of thousands of man-made chemicals, it's about a thousand of them that have endocrine acting properties. Um, Endocrine disrupting chemicals can be found in air, soil, water, supply, food sources, personal care products, and manufactured products. They can be breathed in. That's things like um, car fumes. That's an endocrine disruptor. Or well, they can be consumed in food, as I said. They can also interfere with an actual body function um, in, in its entirety with the endocrine system. So it may not just affect one hormone, it may affect the whole balance. And they can be obviously the contributory factor to endocrine system disorders. Next slide, please. Common EDCs. Well, there's just a list there. I needn't go through it, I think, um, if you want to know more about it. But you can find it in personal care products such as sunscreens, plastics, as I said already. So plastic containers that you put your food in, plastic bottles that you drink water from, pesticides that are sprayed on food, even children's products have them. So be mindful of the fact that these exist and be mindful of the fact that when you make your choices, then you have a choice to have something that doesn't have this in it. Next slide, please. Why should you avoid them? Well, because there's a lot of research that um, says that scientists have been concerned about the possible links between endocrine disrupting chemicals and, and the rapid decrease in health. So this includes things wider than just looking at endocrine system disorders, other disorders and other health issues. The research is not conclusive. So I've read several papers on this. Um, currently, uh, it's concerning enough for those scientists who are working on it to be able to, uh, to, to want to do more research on it and for us to take it seriously and consider it seriously. Uh, some of those conditions that are affected by that are listed uh, on the next part and Changing to clean practices in personal care, household cleaning products and plastic use can obviously reduce your exposure. So you've nothing to lose, but everything to gain, even though the results of all the research are not conclusive. The fact that they're worrying is enough reason, I think, to be able to say, well, actually, maybe we should do something. 
Next slide, please. This is a statement from Heather Portisall, who's Associate Professor of Biology at North Carolina State University. I'm going to read it. We have a lot of diseases that have gone up in incidence with our increased use of synthetic chemicals since the 1950s. That suggests there's an environmental component. The cause and effect relationship is not fully understood and more research is being undertaken. So evidence linking EDCs to adverse health outcomes continues to grow. Constant exposure creates the highest risk, but for a developing fetus or infant, low exposure can have a high impact. This is one of the reasons why I've included EDCs in this presentation. So there's a lot more to be said about them, but that's from a associate professor of biology. So um, hopefully you can understand why it's such a crucial area. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is the area that obviously is part of the nutrition side of what I do. Um, what can I say? Ignore your health and it will go away. Uh, let medicine, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Uh, your body is a temple, so keep it pure and clean for the soul to reside in. Very crucial. Next slide, please. Um, integrative functional nutrition is about more than just telling somebody to eat properly. So you look at somebody's lifestyle, you look at systems and signs and of symptoms from those systems. You look at the core imbalances. So you look at cellular, um, uh, in cellular depth in energy metabolism and what is actually going on within the metabolic, metabolic pathway networks. And you also look at biomarkers. So functional nutrition actually requires most of the time testing, whether that's blood, stool, urine, or DNA testing. Um, but that just gives you a, a, a view of what that looks like in terms of a nutritionist might just tell you what to eat or what's good for you. But this is far more involved. Next slide, please. Okay, eating for health, what does it do? It floods your system with the nutrients, vitamins, and minerals that your body needs to function properly. Just avoiding processed foods. What I mean by processed foods is foods that are pre-made, um, maybe high in refined sugar and salts and in bad fats, can have a very good start to your new way of looking at how you eat. Um, so, cooking from fresh is one of the things that is really, really crucially important. There are very easy recipes that you can look at and there's so many sources nowadays from which you can get recipes like that. Specific endocrine plans are diagnosed by the medical practitioner usually need an individualized nutritional approach. So because there's such a complexity about the way the system works and the different hormones, there's no one solution fits all it would have to be a personalized approach and research shows that eating mediterranean is still the best way for overall health so unless you have existing health issues and allergies then that's the way to go next slide please what does mediterranean diet look like well there's a lot of research material on this saying that this is the best way to eat and if you look at the way that it is you can see all the grains breads uh, 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 underneath and then you've got fruits and vegetables plenty of olive oil because there's omega-6 omega-3 omega-3 is crucial for anti-inflammation and then looking at going up the triangle to fish and seafood your dairy and your eggs your cheese your poultry, and then meats um, and so you can see at the top of the triangle you eat a little bit of it and at the bottom of the triangle you can eat a little bit more of it but that's pretty much what the mediterranean diet looks like next slide please this is a very complex um, uh, thing so again going into it in a very very um, basic manner is that functional nutrition tests can include a number of things medical practitioners do do tests obviously um, Generally, if you're being looked after by the National Health, they're limited by what they can do because it's directed by the National Health. So they may not do things that a functional nutritionist or naturopathic nutritionist would do. And nutrigenomics, DNA is a completely different field. And generally you wouldn't find that, that you would be able to get that in the National Health at all. It would be a private thing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Natural supplements and vitamins. A lot of people take a multivitamin or take natural supplements quite regularly. Um, they can be taken regularly, but only to support healthy eating, not as an alternative to healthy eating. Why do I say this? Because yes, you can take supplements when you want to 
uh, or you're struggling with eating well at a particular time or when there's particular stresses on your life. But actually, there are some contraindications that people are not often aware of. And if you're taking mainstream education like statins, like blood thinners, et cetera, et cetera, it can be quite uh, dangerous because, for example, if you're taking a blood thinner and then you're having too much ginger in its raw form, ginger is also a blood thinner naturally. So then there could be issues. So always double check with a functional nutritionist or medical practitioner to check whether what you're taking might actually be doing more harm than good, whether that's a supplement or not. It doesn't always mean that everything that you take supplementally will do you the world of good if you're taking other medications. Next slide, please. My personal view in terms of a functional nutrition approach is that the pillars of health and well-being are crucial. So we're looking at nutrition. We can talk about how well we eat, but we also need to look at, and that's just physical, we also need to look at our spirituality. We're really lucky. We're part of the Ismaili community. We have a solid base from which to start, but really you need to balance the spiritual, the emotional, the intellectual, lifelong learning, as Hazramam always says. We need to look at the environment, as I've already said, the EDCs. What do you do? Do you recycle? Are you contributing positively to global problems? Um, and then obviously social and community. Well, we've got spiritual, social and community all bottled into one being Ismailis. And we're so very blessed to have that. So I know that at the moment we can't attend Jamakana, but we've had so much from our community in terms of support during this time where people have been isolated. Um, we are lucky. Let's say that. Uh, next slide, please. In summary, then, I just want to say that initially, the best things that you could do is cook from fresh, whatever it may be, simple as it may be, if you take fresh ingredients and you cook from them. And when I say fresh, I don't mean fresh, fresh. It can be frozen because frozen is picked at source and frozen at source. So they retain all the nutrients. It doesn't have to be that you have to go and buy a fresh broccoli or a fresh cauliflower or, or anything like that. Try to include movement. Uh, some people don't exercise. Some people are, are not into going to gyms. But movement means getting up, walking around, taking steps outside. Um, cooking is movement. Doing your washing in the house is movement. Um, you know, uh, playing with your children is movement. So when I say movement, I mean be active as much as you can within your limitations because that makes a difference. Clean up the EDCs, so look at what you're putting around and in the house and on your body and try to look at a way of improving and removing some of those things. Natural beauty products, body products and natural care. There are so many really great companies out there doing that where you don't have to put things on your body and face that are actually absorbing through your skin into your body or, or lipstick that contains products that you're eating unknowingly that you really shouldn't be putting into your body. As I said, ensure that you're not taking medications and supplements that counteract each other and cause further issues. And really it's day one or one day. It's our choice. The small things that we do and there's really, really small changes as per the summary slide can start you on a really positive journey towards improving whatever things that you're uh, going through and um, hopefully that does. Next slide please. So these are my contact details but obviously WAP know who I am and if you require anything or have any questions they're going to be collating everything. Um, so hopefully you've enjoyed what I've spoken about. I know that it was pretty fast, there was a lot to cover. However, Obviously, you've got the opportunity to ask questions, so please do. It was my pleasure to speak to you all. I look forward to seeing you in the future. And I'm now going to hand over to Shenaz Jivraj, who is a consultant obstetrician, who's going to be talking uh, about endocrine health and the future uh, of what we're going to be doing. Thank you very, very much. And Yali Madat. Um, th thank you, Farah. 
Yali Madat, everyone. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here today, to be able to share with brothers and sisters all over the world information that I can share with you about what uh, I do in my everyday work. So I work uh, as an obstetrician and gynecologist, and I look after couples who have uh, problems conceiving. I look after couples who've had problems with recurrent miscarriage. And I look after couples where the female partner is going through the menopause and uh, is troubled by menopausal symptoms. What I would like to do today over the next 20 minutes or so is to give you an overview of the physiology of the normal menstrual cycle and then highlight to you where things could go wrong and essentially provide you with a flavor of future webinars that the Women's Activities Portfolio is planning to hold in due course on infertility and the menopause. And what I'd like to do is first of all, start from the beginning. So this is a slide that shows you the age-related decline in a woman's egg count in her ovaries or what's commonly referred to as ovarian reserve. What we've got here on the y-axis is the number of eggs in our ovaries. And on the x-axis here is lifespan, starting from conception all the way through to the birth of a female, through to puberty, and all the way to the menopause. Now this dotted line here, this dotted line represents a female baby's birth. And at birth, a female baby is born with 4 million eggs. Yes, that's correct. 4 million eggs in both ovaries. And as you can see, as the girl grows older, the number of eggs in her ovaries start to decline. Now, this is natural. It's normal. It's natural cell death that happens. And as the eggs diminish in number, they will eventually peter out to an absolute minimum around the age of the menopause, which is roughly 50 to 51 years in the UK. At puberty, or when menarche happens, when a girl starts her periods, the ovaries have about 400,000 eggs in them. Clearly not each one of them is destined to become a baby. It would not be possible for that to happen. But the age-related decline in egg reserve continues. The eggs in the, in the ovaries continue to diminish in number and go down in number until the menopause. What I'll be speaking to you today about is what happens between the menarche, so when a girl starts her period here, and the menopause, when a girl's periods finish altogether, which is around the age of 50 or 51. Central to this is this particular hormone here called estrogen. Now, estrogen has a variety of functions in our body. This slide here depicts what's described as the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis in the female. What essentially this slide demonstrates is that there is a dialogue that takes place between a tiny little gland in the base of the brain. This structure here is the brain. And in the base of the brain is a tiny little gland called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus sends out a hormonal signal to another gland called the pituitary gland, which also sits very closely to the hypothalamus in the base of the brain. The pituitary gland produces, among other hormones, a couple of hormones called LH, known as luteinizing hormone, or FSH, known as follicle stimulating hormone. And these two hormones, they control ovulation in the ovaries. 
alongside ovulation, they will also inadvertently control production of estrogen. As you can see, there's a dialogue that's going on here, a dialogue between the gland called the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the ovaries. And among other hormones, the ovary produces estrogen. Now, what does estrogen do? I'm assuming a lot of you will be familiar with this structure. This is across a longitudinal section of the uterus. And on the inner aspect of the uterus, there is a lining known as the endometrium, commonly referred to as the lining of the womb or the lining of the uterus, but in medical terms called the endometrium. The endometrium is highly sensitive to estrogen. And what estrogen does is it stimulates receptors in the endometrium, making the endometrium grow in thickness. So the more estrogen there is, the thicker the endometrium becomes. And the main purpose of that is to prepare the endometrium for pregnancy. But estrogen does not have its effect only on the uterus. Estrogen receptors are present throughout the body. Estrogen receptors are present in the brain. They are present in our skin. They're present in the blood vessels, the walls of the blood vessels. They are present in the urogenital tract, so they are present in the vaginal skin. And they are present in the bladder epithelium. They're present in bones. Estrogen receptors are present in our joints as well. And unbeknownst to us, estrogen receptors are constantly being stimulated by estrogen that's being circulated in our bloodstream constantly. And we may not even realize this is happening because estrogen helps to keep these areas stimulated and strong to allow normal bodily functions to happen. Problems start to arise when we, we start to sense a lack in this estrogen stimulation. We start to sense a withdrawal in estrogen stimulation of these essential parts of our bodies, which happens around the menopause when the eggs in our ovaries diminish in number and estrogen production reduces. Now I'll demonstrate to you what happens in the ovary every single month during our reproductive lives. This is a diagram that shows a cross-section of the ovary. So if you took a human ovary, cut a section of it, and examined it under a microscope, what you would find is that the ovary has got scattered within it thousands upon thousands of little eggs. These little eggs, at the start of every single menstrual cycle, a few of them, about five of them in each ovary, will be recruited to develop and to grow. When that happens, a little bit of fluid surrounds each ovary, it surrounds each oocyte or surrounds each egg. And these eggs then develop to a certain degree. And among these eggs, there will be one which will become what's described as the dominant follicle. Within the dominant follicle will be an egg that's destined for ovulation while the other little eggs will start to become atresic or die off. And this particular dominant follicle then will develop a layer of cells surrounding it which produce estrogen. So as this dominant follicle develops, estrogen production also increases. And estrogen production will cause the endometrium to thicken to prepare for pregnancy in case there is pregnancy. 
And there will come a time when this large dominant follicle has matured the egg within it enough to allow the egg to be released. And the egg is then released down the fallopian tube. In the meantime, the cavity that's left behind will start to assume a different type of shape and structure and will produce another hormone together with estrogen called progesterone. So this structure that's left behind, which had the egg in it, now is known as a corpus luteum. A corpus luteum in Latin means yellow body. And that is because under a microscope, it has a yellow appearance to it. It's very functional. It produces a second hormone called progesterone. Let me show you how all this connects up. What I've just spoken to you about is shown here in this first section. A growing follicle, the dominant follicle releasing its egg, and a corpus luteum forming. And this, in this bottom section, what I've demonstrated here is a section of the endometrium or the lining of the womb. And what I'd like you to look at is these, these two hormones here in the section that says ovarian hormones. There is a light blue line and there is a dark blue line. If you look at the light blue line, and map it onto what's happening in the growing follicle here, as the follicle grows towards ovulation, the light blue line, which depicts estrogen, increases. It increases in quantity in the bloodstream. At the same time, in the endometrium, the lining of the womb or the endometrium becomes thicker and thicker and thicker. When ovulation happens, this dark blue line of progesterone starts to increase. What progesterone does is it induces certain changes in this endometrium that's already thickened to prepare it to receive an implantation of an egg that has been fertilized by a sperm. So it prepares it for implantation of the embryo. As you can see, this whole system here is a dialogue between different components of the genital tract and the reproductive tract. And if there is any disruption in this delicate balance that's occurring constantly in our bodies, if there is any disruption to it, the first thing that will happen is ovulation will stop. When ovulation stops, then people start to get problems with conceiving and they have problems with fertility and they develop infertility. And the other thing that might happen when ovulation ceases is someone's periods might become irregular and unpredictable. Now, I don't want you to think that that happens only in the female. In the male, there is an intricate balance too. The hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis exists in the male as well. The hypothalamus releases GnRH or gonadotrophin releasing hormone that causes the pituitary gland to get stimulated to produce the same hormones, follicle stimulating hormones, hormone and luteinizing hormone that it did in the female, except in this case, the end organ is not the ovary, it is the testicle. So these hormones control the production of sperm or control spermatogenesis, and they control the production of testosterone in the testicle. And any disruption to this system can have effects on a detriment in spermatogenesis or interference with spermatogenesis, resulting in male factor infertility. Now, hormonal imbalances are not the only causes of infertility. Physical blockages 
happen, for example, in the fallopian tube. So here, you can see there's a blockage in the fallopian tube, which impairs the passage of the egg down the fallopian tube, impairs the passage of a sperm through the fallopian tube, blocking fertilization. So there are many causes of infertility. Hormonal effects are some of them. And what we're hoping to do in due course is try and address these causes of infertility and what treatments are available in a future webinar on infertility management. If we now move to the other end of the spectrum of the time surrounding the menopause, known as the perimenopause, this is the time of diminished ovarian reserve. Remember, everyone's ovaries will have eggs that will can constantly diminish in number until it comes a stage when there are no more eggs left for ovulation, which is around the menopause, such that ovulation becomes infrequent, spaced out, sparse, Menstrual cycles can get spaced out and infrequent. Menstrual disturbances start to happen. And all this is associated at the same time with an overall reduction in circulating estrogen in our bodies. And this reduction in circulating estrogen doesn't just drop down in a smooth manner. It's associated with fluctuating estrogen levels. It's this fluctuation in estrogen levels that causes the typical menopausal symptoms that women suffer from. Now, experts of the menopause describe the impact of the menopause into the short, medium, and long-term effects of the menopause. In the short term, Vasomotor symptoms, which is a terminology used to describe symptoms such as hot flushes, night sweats, these are experienced by up to 60 to 80 percent of women, and they may last for an average of two to seven years. That does not mean that all 60 to 80 percent of women will necessarily have a problem requiring them to seek assistance to deal with these symptoms. These symptoms may be very mild in some women, not causing a problem at all. And women can simply transition through the menopause having put up with a few hot flushes. But some women suffer from extremely severe form of symptoms or moderately severe form of symptoms that may interfere with their daily living. It may interfere with their mood, and indeed mood swings are a common feature of the menopause. It may interfere with their sleep, may overall affect their quality of life because mood changes, irritability, quality of relationships, memory and concentration problems, these are all effects of the menopause. And remember, these things happen because estrogen receptors which were stimulated when there was enough estrogen in circulation, are now beginning to starve of estrogen in circulation. And similarly, symptoms such as headaches, dry skin, joint pains, all these things are experienced by women in the short term going through the menopause. Now in the medium term, and remember, estrogen receptors are present in the vaginal skin, in the bladder epithelium, and estrogen keeps our tissues and our skin moist and healthy and supple and protected. And when estrogen stimulation starts to dwindle or diminish, women then start to suffer from symptoms in the medium term, such as vaginal dryness, painful sex. Dyspyrunia means painful sex, recurrent urinary tract infections, and even postmenopausal bleeding. And it's not surprising that the peak incidence of urinary incontinence and vaginal prolapse happens in the 55 to 65 year olds. Now in the long term, we know it's common knowledge 
that osteoporosis increases as we grow older, osteoporotic fractures increase with age. And this is particularly important for women who go through a premature menopause, so a menopause before the age of 40 years. Because in such individuals, osteoporosis can set in much earlier in life. Such individuals are also at risk of early onset heart disease. And there is now some evidence coming in that they may be at risk of early onset cognitive decline or dementia. To what extent HRT benefits the preventer of dementia is not yet established. But in women with premature menopause, giving HRT early enough can protect against osteoporosis and uh, early onset heart disease. And what we're hoping to do in the future is try and address this huge problem that affects our society and society in general about menopausal problems that, uh, that women have to, have to put up with. Now, fortunately for us, we've got a best practice document that we can fall back on. So the British Menopause Society has published its guidance, as has the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, or NICE. And what we hope to do in the future, in a future webinar, is address the symptoms of the menopause or the perimenopause, and then fall back on best practice guidance that is available to us so that we can share with the Jamaat information on best practice and choices that are available in transitioning through the menopause. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Shana. And thank you, Farah, as well. You both shared a really interesting introduction to the systems of the body and, and the impact our, home, our hormones can have that perhaps many of us didn't realize. It was kind of like a biology class, which was great. Um, and you've also touched on the fact that uh, there are different and complementary ways to look at our hormonal health, which we look forward to expanding on later in our series. As you mentioned, Shenaz, we'll be touching on infertility and menopause, amongst other health issues associated with our hormones. So thank you both. So now we'll open our Q&A. For those of you who with questions for our speakers today, please remember to ask them in the Zoom chat or through Menti. Menti is anonymous. Um, and we already have a few in. So Farah, we'll start with one for you, please. Um, the question is, I'm 34 years old and suffer from hormonal acne for the last 10 years. My acne is mainly appearing around the chin. I've taken five to six courses of vitamin A supplements and each course lasted for about three months. But after finishing the course of treatment, my acne starts and I still get acne breakouts every day. What do you suggest I should do to avoid these hormonal acne breakouts? Okay, I think that that is a very specific question about a very specific individual and the way that I work is very much about individualizing. So I'd be happy to speak offline um, for, I uh, will be doing a 15 minute chat with people who have issues that they want to address. Um, however, it would be really difficult for me to say, not least taking vitamin A at a very high level can also be toxic. So it may be that, you know, you're not doing the right things, that's all. But I couldn't answer specifically, and I'm really sorry about that. But as I said, I'd need to find out what's going on. It sounds to me like some kind of hormonal imbalance around mm -hmm. the chin and around the mouth is something often to do with hormonal imbalance. Sure. So it sounds better to, to ask for some more information offline. So we can, yeah. we can connect you with that, with that person. Um, so the next question we've got in for Shannon is related to periods. And for someone said, mine have changed from a 28-day cycle to 24-day cycle recently in the last couple of months, with a few days of spotting beforehand, and I'm 41 years old. Is this something to be concerned about? I beg your pardon, what's the age of the lady? 41. 41, it's not uncommon for periods to start to get irregular at this, uh, at this age. This is the classic age at which period irregularities will start. Um, there are a couple of um, variables here. Um, management will depend on whether you've completed your family or not. Um, but if your question was essentially, is this anything to be concerned about? Then the answer is no. I would, however, like to 
reiterate that uh, if you find that your periods are getting heavier, and that does sometimes happen, well, often happens, then do make sure that you do not become anemic in the process and that you do go and you, you do take something, some medication to try and control the flow because there is medication that's available to try and reduce the flow. Just make sure you don't become anemic out of heavy periods, but cycles that, I get, get, that get shorter at this age is not uncommon. Thank you. Clara, we have a question for you. Um, someone who's 32, 32 years old has had a daughter three and a half years ago and has a positive cervical cancer report and has been experiencing a lot of weight gain and has asked what they can do about this. Uh, about the weight gain? Yes. Okay, I mean, again, that's a difficult uh, situation because basically if you've had a positive cervical cancer diagnosis, from my perspective, I would have to work, or a professional functional nutritional therapist practitioner would have to work in conjunction with a medical professional. So in terms of looking at the weight gain, there's probably some sort of hormonal connection again, which, uh, which if she's taking medication for the, the cancer would probably likely happen. Um, one of the crucial things in terms of hormonal balance in, in nutrition world is to have cruciferous vegetables there's a lot of evidence that surrounds uh, eating broccoli, cauliflower, kale, all of those kind of vegetables actually help with estrogen management. So it may be that the weight gain is due to the medication. It may be that it's just um, part of having had the child and then it's not gone away. Shanaz, I don't know if you have Yeah, any... can I come in on this Yeah, please, please do. Is this a diagnosis of cervical cancer or is this an abnormal cervical smear? Because if this is an abnormal cervical smear, then this is not cancer. This is just a screening tool to detect precancerous changes so that cells can be removed before they become cancerous. So it's important to establish this first. Yeah. Secondly, if this is an abnormal cervical smear test, then this is not related to your weight gain. Your weight gain may be due to other causes and you may wish to take on board what Farah has said, but cervical precancerous changes have got nothing to do with weight gain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the person that asked that question, if you, if you have further questions, you can also email us again. This may be one to discuss yeah. offline too. Um, great, one for Shanaz. Um, what can we do if our estrogen level is down? How do you know your estrogen level is down? I don't know if we have more details on this one. Okay, well, what's, the, what's the background? Is it, is it um, menopause? Is it, uh, uh, how, how, how old are they? I'm afraid of that's all we have in at the moment. I think we need a bit more information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you could send in some more information. If, if, they can, if they're happy to send more information, we'll, we might be able to, to help a bit more specifically. Okay. Agreed, yeah. Need more information. Um, another one, maybe, Farah. I try to eat a lot of pulses, beans, fruit and veg, but I get very bloated. And apart from keeping a food diary, how can I tell what could be causing this? Uh, there are various issues that uh, cause bloating. One of them can be your uh, microbiome. So a, a lot of people have been talking about that more recently and how that's connected to immunity and all sorts of reasons, how the probiotics bacteria that are good, that live in your stomach, actually affect the way that your, your, your immune system and your function of, of your GI tract perform. That's your gastrointestinal tract. There are several other reasons that that could be. That could be that you've got a, a small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So, so it's not easy to tell without knowing some of the symptoms. If I looked at the food diary and I looked at some of the greater details, then it would be much easier to decipher what could be causing it. But my first point of call would be saying, well, you know, okay, you're eating pulses and things, but is your uh, digestive system equipped to actually do that digestion it could be a question of digestive enzymes not being enough in which case I would say eat three pieces of pineapple because it's got bromelain 
and bromelain is a really good digestive enzyme. So you could try that just as a starting point and see where you go from that. But if it's actually to do with probiotics and it's actually to do with the microbiome, then it's a little bit more complex. Thank you. Another question we had is around help with lymph nodes placed near the vaginal opening and a solution of its enlargement. If Shanaz, you can touch on that. I'm afraid I'll need more information here. This is, okay. uh, this is perhaps best on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay. So whoever sent that question in, if you, if you would like to discuss more, you could email us and we can connect you on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and final question, if you take fresh ginger regularly, but also take aspirin, would it be worth giving up as both a blood thinners? I think that's what you've mentioned, Farah. Um, I would never, ever, ever tell you to give up taking medication that your medical profession has given you. What I'm trying to say by saying that you can take too many supplements that affect what, or, or, or overdo what you're already doing medically is be aware of that. And if you want to take that ginger, by all means, ginger is good for lots of other things, but speak to your medical professional and say, I'm taking aspirin and I take a ginger supplement regularly. So what should I do? Should I give up one? Should I give up the other? But I would never, it's not part of what I do to have somebody give up something that a medical profession has given. If somebody wants to go that way and wants to follow a completely holistic lifestyle, I would help them on that journey, but I would work with their medical practitioner to do so. So they would have to go to their medical practitioner and say, I don't want to take this anymore. I want to do it in a different way. And I would work with that medical practitioner, but otherwise it wouldn't it's not advice that I would give to stop taking something. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So thank you everyone for sending in your questions. There's obviously a number of variables in how we can approach the answers to these and a lot of it's quite personal for each of us. So um, we couldn't cover all of them here, but after the session, if you would like to contact us, we'd be happy to put you in, in touch for a short um, complimentary chat with our speakers. So I hope you've gained some valuable information through our experts today. There's for sure a lot of food for thought to reflect on. Hormonal health can be supported in many different ways and a mindful approach to our health starts with a connection to our bodies and with our breath. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Rabia Lalani, gastroenterologist and practicing yoga teacher, who is here to share a supportive breathing practice with us. So um, I started by saying thank you so much, Iman, and wow, have you covered a lot of science in the last hour or so. I normally begin by talking about the science of breathing, but I think I'm going to take a different approach with today's session. Um, the thing is, being a conventionally trained medic, I find that the language of science is often so heavily weighted towards ideas such as reduction, deficiency, depletion. And while those are so incredibly useful for understanding um, our organs, I think that there is a nuance to that type of language that means that we're quite up in the head. Um, and it's been going on for some time in Western medicine. So this next 10 minutes is about moving towards a language of rejuvenation, of wholeness and of abundance. So as we move towards that, I would like to guide you for the next 10 minutes or so through a breathwork exercise. And I'm going to assume that you're all breathwork novices. And so I'm just going to explain what we're going to do. And then after you close your eyes, I'm going to guide you. So there's no need to remember any of this as I'll be guiding you over the next 10 minutes. Um, but here it is. We are going to begin with a warm up breath. And today I've chosen bee breath. And it is as it sounds on the tin. It's a bumblebee breath. And we're going to begin with B breath, and then we're going to move on to a diaphragm breath. And the diaphragm is your organ, your sling-like muscle at the bottom of the ribs. It connects the upper chest to your belly, where all the organs you've been talking about sit today. And so we engage this muscle to apply a sense of soothing into the belly. So with B breath, one of the reasons I chose this today um, apart from the fact that bees fertilize from flower to flower, so that kind of sang true, um, is the idea that um, we need to make some sound. You've all been, apart from the speakers today, not using your voice potentially for the last hour. And so it's nice to start with, you know, vocalizing and vibrating our vocal cords. And bee breath is essentially an inhale through the nose, 
you hold the breath at the top of the inhale and you hum out through the mouth. So I'm hoping that you're really going to go for it. I can't hear you. Um, hopefully there's, you know, a, a permissive, safe environment for you to hum today. Um, and we're going to do three hums and the hums are going to get successively louder. So you will just be hearing me hum and then you just join in basically. So I'm going to take a deep inhale and then I'm going to hum out and my hum is going to get progressively louder and we're going to do that three times. You're going to have your eyes closed and then from there I'm going to guide you into diaphragm breath. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to guide it. I'm going to inhale and as I hum out it's going to sound something like this. Mm. You'll have to excuse my <laughs> nasal pastures. Okay, so that's what it's going to sound like. So when you're ready, I would love to invite you all. And if you feel, if you don't feel comfortable, shut your cameras off. The next 10 minutes is all about arriving in a sense of space and embodiment within the body. So when you're ready, relaxing the shoulders away from the ears and closing down the eyes. Allowing the arms to rest in your lap or on your knees and immediately bringing your attention to the breath to your natural breath as it moves in and out of the nostrils. So lips gently closed and just paying attention, paying attention to the breath as it exists in this moment. Gentle inhale, soothing exhale. And as you do so, allowing any thoughts that are drifting in and out to simply rest in the space between your eyebrows. And bringing all of your attention to the cycle of the breath. Just as there are so many cycles within the body, the breath also has a cycle. Deep inhale in your own rhythm, the pause at the top of the inhale and the long exhale out with a pause at the end of the exhale. Following the cycle of the breath, we're going to begin with our warm up breath, which is bee breath, the bumblebee breath. And use the sound to resonate through you. So as the sound comes out of the mouth, out of the lips, in a gentle hum, Allow the hum to resonate like sound through a bell all the way down to the pelvis, down to the belly. And come in at your own time. When we're ready, let's all meet at the bottom of your next exhale. So finish your next exhale, pause, and then take a deep breath in through the nose, drink the breath up and up and up and up. Deep breath in. Last time, deep breath in. And bringing the breath gently in through the nose, out through the nose. As you let the vibration settle, can you bring your hands to your front body? So bring your right palm of your hand somewhere on your chest, anywhere will do, keep the eyes closed, and the left hand to the belly. Right palm to the chest, left to belly, and deepen the breath. Take a deep inhale through the nose, fill the lungs, fill the belly. Exhale, allow the front body to gently return back to spine. Deep inhale through the nose, chest and belly rise. Exhale, allow it to fall gently back to spine. And keep going like this, inviting a sense of abundance into the front of the body as you drink the breath in on your natural inhale. And as the breath falls away on the exhale, taking any tension away with it. 
deep inhale through the nose, exhale through the nose. Good. And as you breathe, can you bring your attention to the bottom hand? So the hand that's moving on the belly, the area where your organs sit, nestled in. And allow that bottom hand to move more than the top hand. Can you allow that bottom hand to rise and fall with more emphasis? Like the waves of an ocean. That's it. Now take a deep breath in. When you're ready, everybody meeting at the top of the inhale, hold the breath briefly, relax the shoulders away from the ears. As you hold the breath, unhold the body, unhold the body. And now exhale all the way out through the nose or mouth. Returning to the natural breath, deep inhale, deep exhale. And keeping your eyes closed when you're ready, relaxing your hands into your lap. And now breathe with me on my count. When you're ready, let's meet at the bottom of the exhale. Finish your next exhale. And then inhale for one, two, three, four, and pause. Exhale, two, three, four, five, and six. Empty out. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale, two three, four, empty the breath and six. Last time, inhale, one, two, three and four. Exhale, two, three, four, five and six. Finish that breath and now allow the breath to return to its natural rhythm. And the idea here is to have extended the exhale and provide a kind of massage for the nervous system. Awareness with the breath, permission with the breath. And as we begin to close the practice, let's bring both hands to the belly this time one on top of the other or side by side. And send the breath again down into the belly. Send it really deep. Inhale, belly rises. Exhale, let it fall. And as you cycle through your own breath and bring the attention to the organs within the belly, can we invite a sense of permission? Permission for the organs to be just as they are. Whatever stage of life we're in, whatever amount of abundance or depletion, can we allow and give permission to the organs to be just as they are in harmony with the body and breath? Lovely. Next inhale, fill the belly, take a deep breath in, and then part the lips, sigh it out through an open mouth. Release the hands from the belly, allow them to rinse gently in the lap. And when you're ready, blinking the eyes open and returning to the room. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rabia. It was a lovely way to calm our bodies and minds down before concluding the event. Um, and I never thought the thought of a bumblebee would ever make me feel calm, but you managed that. So as we close today's session, we wish to reiterate, reiterate to you that we're here to support you. On the screen, you'll see some signposts to our resources. You can always contact WAP or the Azkaban Health Board directly at our email addresses. And you'll also be aware of the Coronavirus Support Team Helpline. 
As we mentioned, in the next part of the webinar series, we will be covering fertility and menopause as two distinct events. We will let you know when these will be held and also keep an eye out on Al-Sahar and social media. WAP have also launched a sisterhood forum, a virtual and confidential meeting group for women to connect with each other. The next meeting will be at the end of July and you'll see posts to these on Al-Sahar and social media too. We don't plan to share the slides from today, but if you want to receive any of the information or also reach out to our speakers for some of those confidential discussions, please let the WAP team know at WAP at IIUK.org. Thank you all for joining us today from all over the world. The WAP team and Aga Khan Health Board and all our speakers wish you all very warmest wishes for calm, strength, peace and good health. Please stay safe, stay safe take good, good care, and know that we are here to inform you and support you to the best of our ability. Thank you and Yali Mazzetta.